Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Inuka Enterprise Program webinar hosted by the Kenya Bankers Association. We are happy to host you. My name is Bani Sonyango. I'm Technical Services Officer at the Kenya Bankers Association, and I will be your moderator for this session. Allow me also to welcome the KBA team. I can see a number of them have joined. Karibu Nisana. Before I introduce our topic of the day and our key speaker, a few housekeeping rules. Number one, kindly mute your mics to enable us to get the most out of the session. Two, we will have a Q&A session after the presentation. Kindly use the chat function to post your questions. I know that most of you have been part of this Inuka journey, but for the sake of those who are joining us for the first time, Inuka is a free SME program developed by the Kenya Bankers Association to build capacity for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises to enable them run their businesses optimally. The training from the program has also been designed to de-risk MSMEs in order to enhance their ability to access financing from banks. The modules are currently being deployed through KBA's Inuka SME program e-learning platform which can be accessed by visiting www.inukasme.co.ke. Our topic of the day, which is 2021 economic outlook and drivers for growth for SMEs, is quite timely. Given the economic environment, micro, small and medium-sized enterprises find themselves in as they grapple with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are now beginning the long road back to recovery. To take us through this topic, we are privileged to have Dr. Samuel Tiriongo as our key speaker. Dr. Tiriongo is Director, Research and Policy at the Kenya Bankers Association. He brings to this forum a wealth of knowledge, having worked in the financial sector for over 13 years, prior to which he was at Kipra. Dr. Tiriongo, Karibu sana. We are looking forward to hearing from you whether we are expecting any policy accommodations or any new of those to just help with this recovery. Karibu, Dr. Tiriong. Thank you very much, uh, Banis, for the introduction. Um, I think uh, it's done all that was needed to be done in terms of introducing the topic for the day. Maybe just to re-emphasize is the issue that we are looking at 2021 economic outlook and really emphasizing more on what needs to be done for us to realize uh, a quicker recovery for the economy and more so the role of the MSMEs. So I'll take you through a presentation that covers uh, the areas that we would like to focus on for the case of uh, uh, the economic turnaround and of course looking at uh, the drivers of growth for SMEs. Just to highlight a few, but in the light of the objective of the forum, which is a, the, the empowering uh, the MSMEs at the end of it all. So um, the coverage for my discussion today would really look at a summary of the economic activities, some of the drivers and the cushions that have been uh, put in place, uh, the economic outlook and the prospects uh, currently as uh, uh, in place, because we all recognize that we uh, in a period when there is extreme uncertainty uh, in the market, of course, drawn from the effects of, uh, of uh, uh, the pandemic, then would characterize the status of the MSMEs in Kenya, drawing from what is already known, and uh, identify some of the growth drivers for the MSMEs, uh, particularly drawn from the lessons that uh, the pandemic has offered to us. Then at the end, conclude with 
the need to develop an MSME's information base for purposes of being able to engage. Because as a banking sector, we look at opportunities of leaning towards MSMEs, but to what extent are MSMEs leaning towards banks is a question that we would want uh, addressed. So just in summary, the economic activity, looking at the drivers and the cushions, we know that uh, in the second and third quarter of 2020 is when we saw quite a dramatic drop in economic activity in Kenya, uh, mostly attributed to the effects of, of the pandemic. We saw the economy contract by 5.5% in the second quarter and 1.1% in the third quarter. But most importantly, we are seeing uh, the con not all sectors actually are moving in the same direction. For instance, we're seeing finance and insurance still remaining strong. We are seeing agriculture providing the much needed reprieve. So the dip would have actually been higher if only some of these sectors that are showing resilience, such as uh, agriculture and finance and insurance, uh, also responded to to, to, to the pandemic in a particular fashion, just like what, what we saw in accommodation and restaurants and also what we've seen in manufacturing. So retail and uh, wholesale trade remains one of those sectors that also continue to face the effects of uh, the pandemic and uh, more so activity in these sectors remain depressed. So we've seen the latest uh, projection for the economy uh, estimates for the economy to indicate that the economy actually contracted by 0.1% in 2020. As much as the earlier predictions had actually uh, pointed to more than this, that is there was a 1% contraction projected in 2020 for 2021, uh, for 2020. So this is kind of, uh, there seems to be some reprieve and uh, economy performing uh, in a manner that can easily be described as it showed some signs of resilience. What we have also noted in observing the behavior of the economies across the world in response to the pandemic is that economic effects of the pandemic have been uneven and uh, the recovery uh, also continue to be non-uniform across different countries. But more so, even within country, we see that the pandemic has affected different sectors differently. For instance, in Kenya, we saw that the sectors that actually require a lot of contacts between people actually suffered the more because we saw the services sector, restaurant and accommodation services uh, really being depressed quite uh, strongly. And uh, uh, things like the lockdowns in Europe and uh, local utilization of hotel services actually have remained uh, depressed to a large extent because of the, the, the measures that are still in place to prevent the spread of the pandemic. But sectors that we describe as contactless, such as agriculture, continue to provide the much needed uh, uh, resilience that the economy needed at the time to really remain uh, afloat. But what we also saw as a reaction to the pandemic's effect is that there were measures that were taken by the government to cushion households and businesses over and above the policy measures that were taken to enhance access to uh, finance for purposes of remaining afloat. There were also measures directly at uh, helping households and businesses uh, uh, get some reprieve from the effects of the pandemic. Tax measures, for instance, taxes were reduced. VAT in corporate taxes came down. Easy loan repayment plans, these were agreed in the banking sector to really provide a support to the segments of the economy that were performing very good previously, but are now under uh, distress because of the effects of the pandemic. Then what we also saw is the digital platforms, the adoption of digital platforms by the banking sector that ensured that there was a, a kind of a less disruption in uh, the services that the banking sector offers to its customers. So the transition by the banking sector was swift, and this is laudable because of uh, 
the, the, this ensured the continuity in the provision of services. The government also put in place measures to enhance payments of pending bills so that the private sector is well uh, uh, facilitated with liquidity for purposes of uh, ensuring that there was a continuation of uh, their activities. And when you look at uh, the status of the what we would call the preconditions for 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 credit, which includes one of them uh, is inflation. Inflation remained uh, stable over the period we saw that since 2018, actually, it has uh, fluctuated around 5%. And this is uh, good for the economy and has actually provided an input in supporting the pricing of credit because inflation remains one of those uh, critical inputs in pricing uh, credit, which is then uh, in support of uh, the growth uh, in credit that we have seen. We've seen that credit has grown, though not so strongly, but it is steady. Now aging up in the upwards of uh, towards 10% on a year on year basis. So the measures that the government took continued to support credit growth, uh, especially where there were issues to do with easy loan repayments. The, this accommodation was offered by the banking sector to its customers, and this ensured that uh, businesses remained afloat. And uh, uh, even those that needed to start up because the pandemic also offered some opportunities for new business lines. Even those that needed to start up their businesses were also accommodated uh, to a large extent. So in a nutshell, we're looking at an economy that is showing uh, a lot of resilience, but more so from the cushions that were put in place both by the government and the banking sector to, to support uh, the enterprises as well as the households that continued to be affected by the pandemic. Now, in terms of looking at uh, where we are now, which is 2021, I know there is a, a ray of hope that things would get better in 2021 compared to 2020 because of the developments uh, uh, around uh, getting a resolution to, 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 to the pandemic. Overall, the economy is now projected to grow by about 7.6% in 2021, and this is much higher than what had been projected earlier for this year, which was about 4.7%. So this is really in line with what has happened since the, 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 the pandemic uh, uh, started or since the pandemic was first uh, discovered in the country. We've now seen schools that were extensively closed in 2020, having been uh, reopened in early uh, 2021 and the removal of some of the containment measures that had been put in place. So against this backdrop, we're seeing an economy growing by, uh, estimated to be growing by more than, uh, projected to be growing by 7.6%. So this is strong growth, but then it would require us to look at several considerations for this to be achieved. It's a projection that is based on some assumptions but most importantly, what needs to be looked at is the issue of the government support. And even as we look at government support, it's not blanket support. We ask ourselves, is it well structured to ensure that the support that is uh, extended to the private sector assures us of a firm recovery? That is important to uh, bear in mind. The other thing is to ensure that there is inclusive growth. An inclusive growth, we say, whatever growth is realized, is it of benefit to a broad-based uh, 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 economic agents? So the hope of realizing this broad-based economic uh, uh, turnaround remains strongly hinged on a number of factors. And one, of course, that the whole world is hinging its, uh, is, uh, its, its hope on is a vaccine. But the questions that we ask around the vaccine is that, is, is the reach proper? Is the pace of rollout okay, consistent with what was expected? We all recognize, and I think all of us agree, that no country is safe from the effects of this pandemic until all countries 
are actually safe. But the other thing that we also need to uh, consider with realizing inclusive growth is a facilitation. And as we consider facilitation, we ask ourselves, is the private sector well facilitated to deliver the growth that we so wish to see? We'll be looking at some of the uh, elements within the facilitation process that would actually need to be put in place. The other thing is unlocking credit to MSMEs requires us to explore what bankers would summarize as the three C's of borrowers, an understanding of the three C's of borrowers. The first C is a cash flow, because as borrowers then approach banks for money, there is a need to understand cash flows of these uh, uh, borrowers, because from the cash flows, then we can determine the ability to pay. The next C is with really, do the customers have the character to pay? Now that's why you, meant, you, you sometimes hear of the reports from the credit reference bureaus, reports from uh, uh, an evaluation of customer risk profile. It's really just to look at the customer in terms of the characters to pay, historical behavior with regard to handling of loans, if they have a historical behavior. That can be described. The other C that bankers would typically be looking at is the characteristics of the borrower. Now, the characteristics of the borrower would really uh, technically just at the end of it all looking at the the who is this customer? Because I know that there are uh, there are requirements from the side of. Uh, uh, the, the regulators and even the regulatory frameworks that there is need to know the customer. Who is the customer? What's the characteristics of this customer? So if all these things are sorted, I think that would facilitate a lot of uh, uh, uptake of credit and a lot of leaning towards each other because as banks lean to the MSMEs, the MSMEs can also lean to banks for borrowing. But the question then that we ask at the end of it all is, who should drive the economic growth agenda? We know that the government at the moment, we're looking at uh, concerns of uh, debt buildup and uh, the issues around debt sustainability, which was actually even mentioned in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the agreement, in the, in, in the just concluded uh, agreement between the IMF and the government of Kenya uh, on a program that there is need to uh, really focus on debt sustainability and issues around reducing borrowing. And uh, so the onus is placed straight on the private sector to deliver the economic growth recovery that we so wish to see. So it must be the private sector. And in the private sector, it must be the MSMEs because the MSMEs are the ones we would say are the ones that cover the last mile of economic activities but are they well facilitated is a question that we would want also to answer at the end of it all. So in terms of trying to characterize the MSMEs, and I think we would be expecting feedback from you on this, is that we would want to assess the information that we know so far about MSMEs. We would want to agree that the information about MSMEs remains scanty to a large extent. What we have seen from surveys that have been conducted before is that MSMEs contribute about a third of the total value of economic activities in a particular year. 30% is not a small uh, number, it is significant. And MSMEs are playing this role. So it's a segment of the economy that needs to be given uh, priority with regard to turnaround. One thing that is also of interest for us to assess is that 92% of the MSMEs are actually micro enterprises. So the question that we'll be asking ourselves, is there room to scale them up to small, scale those that are small to medium, scale those that are medium to large, so that there is growth of this segment? So are these enterprises scalable? to a, a larger, uh, higher level of operation. One other thing that we have also observed is that about 73% of 
5.6 million of these MSMEs are actually unlicensed. They operate at household level and are highly mobile. No fixed location. Now this to a bank is something that would worry a bank because you want steadiness in the operations of a business for it to depict that characteristic of uh, an enterprise that is one depicting characteristics and willingness to pay. This number compared to only about 27% who are licensed and are in fixed locations remains a worry for many uh, lenders. And this is important that we need to highlight for purposes of uh, uh, appreciating the role and the contribution that the banking sector can actually make to the MSMEs. The other thing is about the employment in this uh, segments, which remains highly concentrated in a few sectors. We are seeing uh, a deep concentration in trade and in repairs of motorcycles and motor vehicles. Manufacturing also is key. And uh, the concentration of employment in these segments really depicts an issue that there is no, there is limited room of innovation because there seems to be a mushrooming of businesses around the same line of business, which then is uh, reduces prospects for growth for these segments. So an opportunity to expand their business lines is also of critical concern that would need to be taken on board. The other thing that we are looking at in terms of characterizing the MSMEs is a survival status. We are seeing uh, MSMEs actually about 71% exiting operations in the first three years. And close to 50% is actually 46% of them exit operations within the first year of starting up. This is a concern, of course, because as you get into opportunities for contracting for loans, you would need the going concern consideration to be really on board. And the longer an MSME is likely to stay on board, the more the prospects for it to be supported with credit. So it's a concern and of course it throws us to what are the reasons for the exit? Three main reasons suffice, and uh, these include the shortage of operating funds. Again, we go into the question of, are there hindrances? Are there obstacles to access to funds? And if there are obstacles to access to funds, is there demand for funds at the end of it all? Are, are MSMEs aware of the funding opportunities that are availed uh, in the banking sector as well as other segments uh, of, of, of lenders. The other critical point that comes out is that what is quoted as a reason for exit are personal reasons. This again puts to question the startups of MSMEs. Are they founded on solid business grounds or they are founded on personal interests, which again is, uh, is, is, is a worry for any lender at the end of the day. Then the other thing is too few customers. I, met, I made mention of the issue of uh, uh, concentration in a few sectors of the economy or a few economic activities. Is there room for expanding markets? Is there room for expanding product lines that are offered by MSMEs? because when there is competition for few customers in the same line of business, then prospects for growth are limited to a large extent. So those are the main reasons that are quoted for the exit because you, many, SM, many SMS, SMEs at the end of the day start up and focus on an area that has been explored already. But is there room for innovation, to innovate outside what has been explored? Because where there is less competition, there are better prospects for growth. So COVID-19 presented uh, a greater threat for survival. I'm sure now the survival status may be more threatened even uh, uh, as we consider uh, what used to happen about five years ago. But then are there coping mechanisms? We need to identify the coping mechanisms and the opportunities for growth and resilience of the MSMEs sector. 
Policy interventions have been put in place that continue to provide some reprieve for MSMEs. You know, the government has put in place a credit guarantee scheme, seed capital of about 3 billion shillings, and working closely with the banking sector to now leverage on this. Because it's on the basis of this seed capital that then banks can say, now that you are taking part of the risk to MSMEs, we can also take part in offering credit to the MSMEs in as much as their characteristics continue to look uh, as though there is a lot of risk, but then the, the willingness from uh, the banking sector to take up uh, part of the risk. So the credit guarantee scheme is a noble idea. The only opportunities for scaling it up would actually portend greater uh, uh, impact on the MSME sector. We've also seen loan repayment, uh, 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 loan repayment being being made easy for for borrowers, both household level and the enterprises level. So businesses continue to enjoy some accommodation from the banking sector in terms of the loan restructuring and the repayment plans that are easy accommodating their abilities to pay. The question that we would also ask ourselves is what's the place of uh, SMEs in our economies? So we look at views and perspectives from the EAC market with regard to where MSMEs are placed. So they remain, they are recognized as a critical component in the EAC economy and is actually attributed to the fact that drivers of economic growth in the EAC region require 75% input of enterprises. Most of them are actually MSMEs. So for the entire economy of the EAC to realize a strong turnaround, the input of MSMEs is critical. But one thing that we also assessed and saw for the EAC region is that demand for finance to support their growth remains unmet. So there is real demand. And uh, this demand is unmet because of considerations that we'll be looking at shortly. MSMEs continue to shape the banking landscape from market positioning standpoint. Bankers are leaning towards MSMEs because one of their scale uh, of operations can easily be enhanced if only there was adequate uh, collaboration. So bank networks expansion of the, over the past decade have leaned towards the MSMEs. Portfolio allocation therefore continues to increase, but it is at a slow pace. What we need to ask ourselves, why is it at a slow pace? So there are funding and capacity enhancement partnerships. I made mention of the business operations and the way the many of them are actually grounded at a household level and they remain micro in nature. So partnerships have come up, but the interest of the partnerships is really one is to formalize the businesses that MSMEs are current, currently undertaking and at the same time also be able to assure them of a longer survival even as they carry on with their businesses. But what we ask ourselves at the end of the day is that in as much as the MSMEs have informed the orientation or the service provision by banks in the EAC region, what really prevents their growth? What prevents their growth is what we can now use for purposes of gauging their potential. The drivers of growth for MSMEs as based on the lessons from the pandemic. We take a five point approach to this to really understand the growth potential. One is that MSMEs need to build and entrench market linkages in the supply chain. We noted that during the pandemic period, the segments of the economy that were not strongly uh, grounded in terms of linkages with the supply chains, in terms of linkages in the supply for inputs as well as distribution channels for output, those that had weak linkages suffered more than those that had contractual uh, linkages. 
in terms of supplies of inputs and supplies of products that are generated. So there is need to build and entrench linkages. So they need to work together in partnership with suppliers of input as well as supply as well as distributors of output at the end of the day because uh, at uh, at an onset you many en enterprises would be performing on the level of security okay some layers of security with the additional okay. i think we can we can continue so we noted during the pandemic period that uh, those that suffered most were those that had weak linkages with their suppliers of uh, of inputs as well as their distributors of products. We also noted that there is diversify. Diversification is important to reduce vulnerability to different types of shocks in the market. So the diversification that we're looking at here in terms is in terms of the products as well as markets. So as we consider this, the MSMEs need for survival basis to not only look at single lines of operations in terms of their businesses, but they need to diversify. Because as I mentioned earlier uh, on is that the economy was affected, many sectors of the economy were affected differently. There are those that performed well. Even the pandemic uh, introduced new business lines that then needed to be taken advantage of. But there are those that really continue to suffer the effects of, uh, of the pandemic. So those that had their business lines diversified across the different sectors actually uh, remained afloat to a large extent. So MSMEs need to diversify their business operations. The other thing is, uh, the need to adopt technology, digitalization and innovations uh, assured those that were operating under the pandemic of continuity in service provision. Banks didn't have much of a challenge in transitioning to the online platforms. Banks didn't have much of a challenge in uh, transitioning to the digital platforms. So even MSMEs that had uh, opportunities to log in to innovations like, for instance, the marketing online and distribution to point of sales that are closer to their customers really had their businesses afloat during the pandemic period. So they need to be agile and be able to be flexible to adopt technology is important. And technology need not to be sophisticated technology. It is a it's a platform is the platforms for selling. Shops are now getting into online platforms, which are very minimal operational uh, costs. So technology is recognized as a business facilitator and an enabler to uh, carrying out businesses, especially in a situation like what we are in today under the pandemic. They need to keep good records. Now, this is important and I'll be emphasizing this more information is capital at the end of it all the need for us to emphasize this is we can do this over and over time and again because in, it is information that is important to the lender and not the the is it, it is what introduces the lender to credit at the end of it all so i'll be emphasizing a little more on this and uh, the need to build strong partnerships with strong financial partners. Because at the end of the day, you need a partner that would be there for you during a crisis. One is stable, one who is resilient, one who is assured of, uh, of its continuity going forward. So some loan products that are available in the market are quite expensive, but the assurance of being there for you during a crisis is also limited to a large extent because they also face the same uh, shocks uh, just as the rest of the smaller uh, agents. So partnerships with strong financial uh, 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 lenders is good 
and it was actually assure uh, businesses of growth. Uh, and, and of course, the ability to scale up their operations would also be uh, uh, be assured if there is a partnership with a strong uh, financial lender. I will be emphasizing a little more on the information on MSMEs that is critical for their growth. I men mentioned that information is capital for the growth of MSMEs. A survey that was done by World Bank on enterprises, actually a series of surveys from 2007 to 2018, showed that access to finance remains one of the most critical and important uh, growth factor for MSMEs. But you can see that even um, from the small, medium to the large enterprises, it's only up to 27%. The extent to which uh, access to finance determines their growth. So we still ask ourselves, what other factors account for the 73%? There must be other attributes of MSMEs that determine their growth potential. What we have done as an initiative from the Kenya Bankers Association is really to put in, in place information exchange platforms. The recognition that this is actually going to support the MSME sector, especially if they are willing to lean towards uh, the banking sector with provision of information. So on our end, the information platforms that we put in place But one thing that it offers to the market is that it's a, actually a shopping guide for credit seekers. I'll demonstrate to you um, how the website is actually uh, uh, structured is that it offers a customer an ability to look at the different uh, um, banking products that are availed to them at different uh, interest rates and as well as also explore as i mentioned is a shopping guide so explore within the banking sector which bank offers the best uh, facilities at least based on the characteristics of the business so we are looking at a website uh, we have offered this service so that uh, entities can actually log in and check if they wish to borrow a given amount of money. You can actually log in and say, this is the match that I want to borrow. This is the type of loan. Is it a business loan? Is it uh, a secured or an unsecured loan? And you'd be able to tell at the end of the day, three aspects from it. One is the interest component that the bank would charge. The third party charges, because for any loan, there would be legal fees and uh, there would also be insurance component, and more so even the bank charges that uh, are extended to for any particular loan that is extended. So all this is actually to enable the businesses and borrowers at the end of it all be able to shop for the best credit that is availed, uh, that can be availed to them. So we continue to update this website and make this information available from all the bankers for the basic reason that with a shopping guide availed to the customers, they would be able to, to actually check what's available for them uh, in the market and pursue uh, accordingly. But then we also look at information platforms for lenders, because in as much as they're serving customers, we look at the information platforms for lenders. And with this, we recognize that uh, moment there is limited information offered by borrowers to lenders, then the need for using third party agents to actually get an assessment of the borrower characteristics becomes more important. What am I? I'm trying to emphasize the point that the more information availed to the, to the lender, the less the need to explore third party agencies for description of the borrower. So we know of the credit reference bureaus that actually pick histories of uh, uh, your borrowing uh, uh, characteristics. 
in line, of course, with what I mentioned earlier, that we look at the character to pay, which now borrows heavily from your history. So, and of course, the individual customer assessment based on what is availed is what is currently assessed by the lenders. What the question that we ask ourselves is that, is there room for enhancing this information base? Definitely, yes, there would be room for this. And that's why today we are holding this session just to point to you that information is critical, information sharing is important, and is actually capital for lending. KBA is planning to carry out a survey to narrow the information gap because we realize that there is limited information that is shared between borrowers and lenders. So as we narrow this information gap, of course the focus primarily is on the MSMEs because it is in the interest of banks to build longer term linkages with MSMEs. So in this survey that would be carrying out mid this year, between May and June, would be looking at the loan facilities and financing options that MSMEs consider as the best for their businesses. Of course, MSMEs drawn from different sectors of the economy. We'll be looking at the loan instruments that best serve MSMEs. Some of them are already available in the market, but an opportunity for us to really gauge from the demand side, the people demanding for credit, whether this would actually meet, what is offered currently would meet this demand. And of course, the price considerations and the total access to credit uh, considerations would also be uh, looked at, among other uh, areas of uh, information capture that is relevant to build the linkages between MSMEs and the bankers to ensure that the MSMEs are well facilitated to deliver the uh, economic uh, recovery to also assure themselves of growth in while they operate and reduce the, the, the incidences of short periods of uh, survival upon starting up. So that's in a nutshell what we are doing uh, from the KBA side. So, and that marks the end of my presentation for today. We'll be coming up to you with more engagements uh, in the future with regard to building this relationship between MSMEs and the banking sector. So that's it for me from now. I'll invite questions and uh, uh, from, uh, from the participants. And I think uh, Banis at the beginning did mention to you that if you have any question, you can put it on the chat box for, for, our, for our response. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chiriongo, for that very insightful presentation. Again, kindly post your questions using the chat function. Maybe I can open up the session, Dr. Chiriongo, and I know you have said that uh, access to finance remains the single most important growth impediment for MSMEs. What do you think about the product offerings available today from banks targeted towards MSMEs? Are they well suited and uh, or how can you say that they should be in terms of making them better suited to aid MSMEs in their journey to recovery? Thank, thank you for your starting up the questions uh, section. I think uh, to a large extent, most of the products that are currently provided in the market serve certain segments of, of businesses because we all agree that bankers don't have a uniform um, product that cuts across all the, all, all, all the segments of the economy and uh, all the segments of the, of, of the borrowers. But ideally, they are structured to suit certain uh, business lines. But of course, there is always room to improve on how best these these uh, products can be can be calibrated or can be uh, structured to serve 
a larger segment uh, of the economies. So, and that's why they need to really get the feel from the ground and understand what do they actually need so that uh, tailor-made uh, products can actually be created uh, in line with uh, uh, the needs of the market. So to a large extent, the products that exist serve certain segments of the of the economy, but scalability, the ability to now reach out to more needs also to be explored, which now requires input from 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 the businesses themselves. And this is the opportunity that we are offering. Thank you. I think you are muted, uh, Banis. Oh, apologies. I'm saying that uh, so this opportunity will come in the way of the SMEs around May, June, when we'll be conducting that survey. So it would be very important for the SMEs to participate in this survey, just uh, to narrow that gap, as you mentioned earlier. So we have a few questions. We have one from uh, James Kimani, who's asking for a recap on the three C's of borrowers. Okay. So maybe we can take... Uh, if there is any additional question so that I answer both the all at once. Okay. We have another question from Yatabe. What impact can be expected by credit guarantee scheme? Okay. Maybe I can take those as we as we invite more questions for for us to 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 put an answer on or to put a response to so james you asked about the three c's for borrowers uh, this is a summary of the characteristics that uh, or what considerations that bankers look at when they actually want to uh, serve borrowers one I, the first c is about cash flows an assessment of the customer's cash flows, an assessment of, uh, and of course from the cash flows is really to gauge the ability to pay. So the first C is cash flows. The second C is to the character to pay. Does the customer have the character to pay? So from the character to pay, now we look at the historical behavior of this, of this customer. Is there evidence that this customer uh, has demonstrated that they actually have the behavior to pay. Then the third C is characteristics of the same customer. Who is this customer? It's different from the character. It's the characteristics, attributes of the customer at the end of the day. So is there a potential? Because you may, you it, it may be your first instance of picking a loan. So you don't have a history, but then what are your characteristics? at the end of the day. It's important to portray this. If this information is well availed to, to the lenders, it makes it much easier to process your requests uh, uh, for loans, because at the end of the day, it is information that then places you at a particular point of risk. Good information, then it means you're low risk. Failure to give information, then there is potential for uh, to be given a higher risk uh, rating. So that's what uh, the summary of the three C's uh, covered, James. Then there was a question that uh, on the uh, credit guarantee scheme, I know the government has announced uh, a three billion seed capital for credit guarantee scheme, and I think it is an opportunity for us to really highlight what this meant is that the funding of the credit guarantee scheme was now to offer kind of a part, uh, I don't want to use the word leverage for this, for this meeting, is really to mean that if there is a three billion seed capital that the government has offered to, 
to, to, to facilitate lending to MSMEs, it then means that banks can multiply this up to four times. It can offer up to 12 billion shillings as lending to MSMEs. But in terms of taking up the risk, it means that the government has offered 25% of their funding, they has actually offered to cover 25% of the risk. So the banking sector would still need to cover 75% of the, of, uh, of the risk. That again, in as much as the, 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 so if this value of 3 billion is actually enhanced to say five, it means it will take up what is available to be lent to MSMEs to 20 billion because five uh, multiplied by four is 20 billion. So these funds are not extended to banks for own lending, but they provide a cover for the loans that banks would actually be extending to the private sector. That in the event, in the unlikely event that borrowers fail to pay and then the government covers up to 25% of the risk. I think this is important for clarification that the funds are actually not extended to banks for own lending, but it is some form of insurance against uh, any, any lending. And again, it only covers 25% of, uh, uh, of the risk. So there is still 75% of the risk that would be borne by the bankers. And that's why it is still important that for an MSME to access these uh, finances, it's still important to seek to improve your risk profile. And that's why we emphasize on providing information. Adequate information to lenders would enhance your risk profile and therefore your possibility to access the funds uh, offered under the credit guarantee scheme. I believe I have uh, answered. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you. Yes, we have another question from Marianne, who asks, most financial institutions are wary of offering credit facilities to startup businesses, and so this makes many potential entrepreneurs back off. What is KBA doing to improve this? Well, Th thank you again for, for, for that question. Now we are talking about uh, startups. So we are looking at a business that possibly doesn't have a history. And uh, there is no characterization in terms of what we call the character to pay because there is no history to back it. And therefore, the need to provide, uh, that's why we emphasize on information. So characteristics of the startup business, to what extent are you exposed to the market? Are you well diversified? Are there prospects for growth? Are there prospects that you're possibly entering a market that is, uh, there is oversupply of what you're supplying so that the risks of your business are heavy? So in terms of characterizing the business, as I did mention, the need to diversify your business lines is also important. So. For us, we would want to really, and that's why we, we are going back to the issue of can we capture as much information as possible in trying to characterize or put a character to the MSMEs that we are serving uh, at the moment. So for startup businesses, you would need to provide a little more information because you don't have the history no. to actually uh, pay. But other considerations also, would be in line with your uh, credit assessment platforms. Is there collateral that can best cover your business? Are there business prospects that you are exploring? Are there measures that you've put in place to ensure continuity of your service? Are there uh, proper records? Are record keeping formalized? So this, this is important uh, information base that would actually be critical for, for your success in partnerships with the banking, uh, uh, the banking, uh, the, 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 the lenders from the bankers. 
So I don't know whether I've answered. I think uh, you can always come back to the question if it's not uh, answered. <laughs> Thanks for that, Sam. I think you have answered. Then we have another question from James Mbugwa who asks, how are banks going to navigate the reality of many businesses that shifted to home offices in the face of the pandemic as they consider credit worthiness, factoring in your observation that operating at household level and high mobility impedes lending? Well, um... Would, would take it back to the reasons of moving back to household level, of course, is a is an is a clear indicator, of course, in terms of the the foundations of the business with regard to its resilience. So one is a, is technically a pointer that the the the, uh, the business still needs to entrench itself in terms of the uh, its stability and put in place measures to assure itself of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of operations, even in a case where we have uh, a pandemic. So for us, we, we look at it from the other way. How can we move out of operating from household level to have fixed locations that are assured, whether there is a pandemic or not? How can we move out of uh, being so vulnerable to the shocks that come to the economy to being very steady. And that's why we mentioned about building partnerships with strong financial lenders that can then assure us of maneuver in case of uh, in case of uh, in case of, uh, of a shock, just as we have, how can businesses maneuver out of it? How can it survive? One, we mentioned about diversification. Because if you're dealing with one line of business, it's a higher risk. If you're dealing with more lines of business, it's a lower risk. Because then when, when one side of the business is low, the other side of the business can actually provide the much needed reprieve. The other thing is, as I did mention, is to build linkages with the uh, of input and distributors of products because even when you're facing a, a, a period when uh, sales are low and you have relations with uh, input suppliers including borrowers including lenders then there can be an understanding so close collaborations with input suppliers is critical so that there be a crisis there is no incidence of having to move out of your location to a location that now appears risky for the lenders. So having a base of operations is critical. So now that you have possibly found yourself operating at a household level, the next objective would be how do we move and build a stronger foundation in a fixed business location? Because we have now realized that a fixed business location gives you better profile to the lenders. So that's my views. Thank you. Thank you for those views, Dr. Chiriongo. I think we can see that time is not on our side. We can take two last questions. Um, the first one, we can see a question from Nuru. As a follow-up on credit guarantee, please speak to why such programs help with access to funding for SMEs. And thanks, Nuru, for highlighting that. And uh, if, if we actually look at the the reason for the program was to, we call it the risk lending, but it's actually reducing the risk among the borrowers. Because uh, as I mentioned, is that bankers look at risk before they lend, they extend their loans to uh, any borrower, including the MSMEs. But MSMEs, as, as I've characterized before, there seems to be need to improve information capture from MSMEs. So that potents them or places them at a high level, elevated level of risk because of the information available and also the mode of operations. So the credit guarantee scheme was started up to share the risk 
that is extended to MSMEs as currently structured. But then we say uh, that in as much as this would offer some support to MSMEs to a large degree, because part of the risk that is borne by bankers has actually been shouldered by, by the government, there's still a 75% that bankers still have to bear, which is not a mere, uh, a small amount. So to a large extent, there is uh, the credit guarantee scheme, a noble idea, but room for expanding it is also good. But most importantly, how can we reduce the need for credit guarantee? How can we improve our risk profiles as MSMEs to reduce the need to be guaranteed for us to access funds? So it may offer support, but let's look at it as short-term support. We still need to do something with the way we do business as MSMEs for us to reduce the need to only be guaranteed for us to access credit. So we need to relook at our own operations to a large extent to assure the uh, lenders that we actually do not need guarantees. We can stand on our own and be able to get loans and service them accordingly. So that's the, uh, in as much as we celebrate the credit guarantee scheme as a, as a noble idea, the need for us to relook at the need for a guarantee also is noble. Let's work our way out because there is still 75% uh, of the risk that is borne by bankers in this in this scheme. Thank you. Thank you. And to our last question of uh, the session, how is the new data protection law affecting banks when it comes to disbursement and collection of debt? This is from Eugene. OK. Eugene, that's a good question in terms of uh, uh, in terms of providing uh, uh, an input to the information frameworks that we are actually looking at. So the data protection law, to a large extent, as much as it protects uh, uh, sharing of information, personal information to uh, to to third party agents is also to a large degree, uh, in our view, an impediment to, to, to easing the lending by, 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 by banks. Because if then there is a new hurdle to get approval to access data, then it means it is becoming more and more uh, difficult to obtain personal information on, on an individual that is showing interest for, uh, for a loan. So it now takes the responsibility to provide adequate information on the borrower, because then you're reducing the what is availed through third parties through the law, because of the the provision in the law. So it takes full responsibility and uh, it requires uh, a larger contribution in terms of providing information. Uh, uh, requires borrowers to provide much more information to uh, to lenders for purposes of facilitating lending. Thank you, Dr. Tiriongo, for that very insightful presentation. Um, something to take away, I know you have mentioned that MSMEs have a strong growth potential. But with this in mind, they also have work. They need to build and entrench market linkages in the supply chain. They need to diversify products. Let's not only look at single lines of operation. They need to adopt technology. Technology is really an enabler. It really needs not to be very complicated. We also need to keep good records because really, as you have told us, information is capital. And lastly, they need to build strong, strong partnerships. Thank you, thank you so much for that very insightful presentation. Do you have any takeaway or any parting shot? Yeah, um, 
I think in summary, uh, thanks uh, Bernice for summarizing the contents of our presentation. What I would only urge is that even as we build this information capital, let's build the engagement that we have because it is through these engagements that we build relationships. And banks, we can assure you, are the strong financial partners. Let's build relationships. Let's build understanding between each other. And that understanding would actually provide some gains. There would be benefits out of it. And the benefits mostly would accrue through lending to, to the MSMEs. So partnerships are welcome. Partnerships are encouraged. Partnerships in terms of information sharing are also welcome. Over and above the platforms that we have, as we seek to build this information base for MSMEs, let's contribute to it. Even as we request you to participate in our survey, at least for now, you would understand the importance of the information capture for purposes of building the relationships between MSMEs and banks. Thank you very much, and we look forward to greater collaborations in the coming days. Thank you again, Dr. Chiriongo. As we wrap up, let's please plan to participate in the survey that we have mentioned that will be around uh, May, June, as we look forward to narrowing that gap between borrowers and lenders. So thank you again, Dr. Chiriongo, for that very insightful presentation. Thank you very much for making time our participants to be with us today and for the very interactive session. We look forward to hosting you again. We will share the slides and the presentation after the session. Asante Nisana, we hope that this has been of great value to you. Thank you. You may leave at your own pleasure. Thank you for another Thank you.